Welcome to the first lecture in Applied Math. This course will be a survey of many branches of mathematics as applied to the physical sciences. The method that we will employ in this course is abstraction first, then application. That is, we will take a given concept and reduce or distill it to its most fundamental nature and then show how it applies in a variety of situations. I will use the following texts as references for these lectures. Mathematics for Physical Chemistry, 3rd edition, by Mortimer. Mathematical Methods in the Physical Sciences, 3rd edition, by Boaz. And Mathematical Methods for Physicists, a Comprehensive Guide, 7th edition, by Arfkin, Weber, and Harris. Now these are very good texts, but it is my very strong opinion that a course is poorly structured and designed if a student's success or failure depends upon the texts that he or she owns. And so it is not necessary that you own these texts. I will make my lecture notes available to anyone who asks. Just send me a personal message here on YouTube with your email address and I'll add you to my distribution list. The topics that we'll explore in this lecture include basic notions from set theory, an introduction to relations and functions, and an introduction to algebraic structures. Okay, so if you open any textbook in mathematics, chances are you will find an introductory chapter or an introductory section that deals with set theory. The reason for this is that set theory is the foundation upon which all of modern mathematics is built. And just as in geometry, where we start with primitive notions, undefined terms such as a point, line, plane, or space, uh, in set theory we begin with the primitive notion of a set itself. And so we accept as a fundamental intuitive fact that a set is a collection of objects and those objects are called the elements or members of the set. So at the end of the lecture, take a moment to reflect how everything that we define and everything that we prove from this point forward ultimately relies on the notion of a set. Now, part of learning mathematics is learning the symbolic language of mathematics. So let A be a set. This notation means that X is an element of the set A. And this notation means that x is not an element of the set A. So let's look at some examples. Let A be the set of all lowercase letters in the English alphabet then the lowercase letter B is an element in the set A but the uppercase letter B is not an element in the set A So a second example, let the set, which we denote with the ornate letter Z with a subscript 2, be the set which contains the elements or the numbers 1 and 0. Now uh, one way to denote a set is to list its elements as we did in this case using uh, braces. Then the number 1 is an element in this set, which we call the set of integers modulo 2, but the number 2 is not an element in this set. So one thing to notice about sets is that a set is completely determined
by its elements. And if it is possible to uh, determine whether or not a given object is or is not an element in a given set, then we say that that set is called well-determined. Now every set that we will discuss in this course is a well-determined set. So a set com is completely determined by its elements, and the elements of the set can be listed in any order and distinct elements can be listed more than once. So let's look at an example to clarify this. The set of integers modulo 2 is the collection of two distinct objects, those objects being the numbers 0 and 1. This set is well defined since given any object it is possible to determine whether or not that object is or is not a member of the set. It does not matter the order in which we list the elements. It also does not matter if we list a given element more than once. The set of integers modulo 2 still consists of only two distinct objects, those objects being the uh, numbers 0 and 1. So now we're ready to give our first true definition. Let A and B be sets. Then the set A is a subset of the set B. And this is denoted A subset B if and only if every element in the set A is also an element in the set B. And if A is a subset of B, we also say that B is a superset of the set A. So let's look at this notation for subset and some other notation that we will need. So this notation means a is a subset of B. It also means that B is a superset of A. We also read this notation as A is contained in the set B. And this is why the uh, notation for subset is uh, something like an elongated letter C. And we also read this as A is included in the set B. Now some other notation that we will need includes what is called the universal quantifier, the upside down letter A. And this means for every or simply every. We also have what is known as the existential quantifier, which is a uh, backwards letter E, capital letter E. And this means there exists at least one
And we also have this symbol, uh, the existential quantifier with a prime sign. And this means there exists exactly one So the definition of subset can be written in notation as follows. A is a subset of B if and only if for every element X in the set A that element is in the set B. Now I have abbreviated the phrase if and only if by IFF Another way to denote the if and only if is using the biconditional symbol, a double-headed arrow, and this is read implies and is implied by. So now we're ready to prove our first lemma, and that is that every set is a subset of itself. So proof, let A be a set, and let X be an element in the set A, then for every element X in the set A, that element remains in the set A, And hence, by definition of subset, A is a subset of itself. So next, we take an axiom from set theory. There exists a unique set, which we denote this way. that has no elements and this set is called the empty set or null set so let a be any arbitrary set then the empty set is a subset of the set A now notice that the empty set satisfies the definition of subset vacuously that is there are no elements in the empty set that must be contained in the other set which we have called A. So a new definition. 
Once again, let A and B be sets. Then the set A is equal to the set B if and only if both A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So the condition that two sets are equal is equivalent to the condition that each set is a subset of the other. And so to prove that two given sets are equal, we must demonstrate that each set is a subset of the other. That is, we must demonstrate set inclusion in both directions. So now that we have uh, this definition for set equality, we can look at some related notation. around the uh, concepts of set equality and subset. Once again, this symbol, A is a subset of B, means that for every element X in the set A, that element is also in the set B. This notation, A subset equal to B, means that either A is a subset of B or A is equal to B. So if A is a subset of B, then A is a subset of B that is possibly equal to B. And if A is equal to B, then A is a subset of B that is equal to B. And this notation, which we read uh, subset not equal, it has the same uh, symbol for set, uh, subset equality with a bar through the equality sign, and this means that A is a subset of B and A is in fact not equal to B. So we can now give a new definition. If a is a subset of B which is not equal to B, then the set A is called a proper subset of the set B. So next we'll prove a new lemma. If A is a subset of or is equal to B, and B is a subset of or is equal to C, then A is a subset of or is equal to C. So proof. Suppose that A is a subset of or is equal to B, and B is a subset of or is equal to C, then as A is a subset of or is equal to B, we have that either A is a subset of B or A is equal to B. And as B is a subset of or is equal to C, we have that either B is a subset of C or B is equal to C. And so there are four cases to consider. So case one, A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C. So as A is a subset of B, we have that for every element X in the set A, that element is also in the set B. And as B is a subset of C, we have that for every element in the set B, that element is also in the set C. And so for every element in the set A, that element is in the set C. And thus by definition, A is a subset of C and hence, A is a subset of or is equal to C.
So case two, A is a subset of B, and B is equal to C. So as B is equal to C, we can replace the uh, set B with the set C. And so A is a subset of C, and hence A is a subset of or is equal to C. So case three, A is equal to B, and B is a subset of C. So as A is equal to B, we can replace the set B with the set A. And so A is a subset of C, and hence A is a subset of or is equal to C. And case four, A is equal to B, and B is equal to C. And so A is equal to C, and hence a is a subset of or is equal to C. So in any case, if A is a subset of or is equal to B, and B is a subset of or is equal to C, then A is a subset of or is equal to C.